If you saw the show Naruto, you would see that Naruto has a monster inside of him. That monster is kind of like dyslexia, but at the end of the show, he makes that monster his friend, and that's sort of what I did. We noticed some red flags going up when he was accepted into pre-K. We had some conversations with his teacher, and he was struggling with letter recognition, retention. He would learn something one day, forget it the next. And we also didn't understand that he was dyslexic off the bat. We had teachers down at his school saying he had ADHD. And we both kind of knew that that was not what the problem was, because he can stay focused just fine. They put me in a special ed room, and that, for ADHD, and that, that angers me a lot. There's more to dyslexia than you think. Some of the common misperceptions of dyslexia include the fact that it's only letter reversals. The second thing I often hear is that visual therapy could help. It's neurobiological in its origin. That would not benefit children with dyslexia. And the third thing I often hear is that it's a lack of work ethic. And that's simply not the case. Children with dyslexia work two to three times harder than any child. They are trying to crack the code with instruction that doesn't allow them to do that. And that's why an intensive or Gillingham approach is necessary. It's a multi-sensory, evidence-based approach that's very structured in its format. It allows the child to have multiple repetitions because children with dyslexia need that. But it also teaches each skill in a discrete way to make sure that each component is attended to. He wants to be a normal kid. He wants to do what the other kids are doing. And when the teacher's like, OK, we're all going to read, he's looking at the page and it's like a, a, a different language. And so I think he started having some anxiety just about going to school and also some frustration and anger because the other kids were making fun of him because he wasn't able to read at the same level that they were reading at. The minute I picked him up from school, he would get in the car and would just be in tears. I realized he was holding it together all day long just so that it didn't show to anyone. It was mostly in school I got bullied because of my dyslexia, and that really decreased my confidence a lot. Really hurt, deep. You don't understand how complex that problem is until you have to deal with it with your kids. I mean, the first thing that happened when we got the diagnosis is like, oh, I'm a failure as a parent. But you want to help your kids, and it's like, I have no idea how to help you with that. I came across Vanderbilt Reading Clinic and emailed them, and luckily I got Sissy. Sissy's amazing. She she isn't like other teachers. She's like, um, how do I put this? The goddess of teaching. Since he worked with Sissy, it's like a 180. It really is with his confidence, as well as his reading abilities. But math and science and history, all of that stuff, if you're going to learn it effectively, you have to be able to read. I think what I'm most proud of when I think of Connor is the amount of dedication and grit that he had to our instruction. I think people don't understand how much work goes into trying to process and work through a structured literacy lesson. And so to see him now doing the things that he loves with reading not being such a huge obstacle, I couldn't be more excited for him. I got an award in my ELA class, actually, for most creative. And that's surprising to me because it doesn't even feel like I have dyslexia because of Sissy. And my life could have gone way different without her. her teaching and her intervention and the intervention of the Vanderbilt completely altered the course of my son's life. And it's kind of a miracle. And I love my kid, what can I say? Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Well, that's not really fair. People like to say, I, I can't believe I had to follow that. I can't believe I had to follow that. I, uh, I'd seen the video. 
um, yesterday, and I had resolved not to tear up. Uh, that turns out to be a failure. I, I tear up when, at the Little League World Series, they execute a double play perfectly. And so I had no chance uh, with, with what we just saw. In a few moments, we're going to make an announcement about a transformative gift that Vanderbilt has received because of the generosity of the Roberts family. And what's so important about this is evidenced by what we just saw in the video, and that is the impact. And if we can scale the kind of impact that we just saw in Connor's life to a deeper, broader community, this will be indeed truly transformative for our capability here at, at Vandy. Um, I'd like to start, if we could, with a round of applause for Connor and his family and Sissy. Connor, uh, a, a lot of the grown-ups in the room are involved in the chance to make videos like the one you were just in. And uh, you're better at it than almost all of us R right now. And so we all have a sense of how bright your future is in so many regards, but I think you need to put an alert out to George Clooney that you've got him in, his, in your sights as well. You have a very bright future indeed, and uh, thank you for sharing your story with us. Um, my, my next job is to introduce a man for whom I have a high regard, not just because he's my boss, and this is our Chancellor Daniel Deermeyer. Um, I think you'll find his story uh, both impressive and interesting. Daniel was raised in Berlin and took, uh, he's, the, he's the first member of his family to complete high school. And we talk about first-gen college students. He, in fact, was first-gen at the high school level. He then took his uh, bachelor's and his first master's degree in Munich. He won a fellowship from the German government, which allowed him to travel to the U.S., where he enrolled at USC. He got his second master's there in philosophy, went on to get a PhD as well in political science at the University of Rochester, and began his uh, teaching and university career, first at the Stanford Graduate School of Business, which he followed by an appointment in three faculties, but mainly at, uh, at Northwestern in the Kellogg School, again, the business school there. Uh, from there, he went to Chicago, where he took on his first deanship in the Harris School of Public Policy, and from that, rather swiftly moved up to provost. And uh, thankfully, our board was able to catch him just before time for his next promotion and attract him to Vanderbilt in Nashville, where he became our chancellor. So please join me in welcoming Daniel Deermeyer. Well, thank you, John, for the kind introduction. My special thank goes to Sissy Peters, the O'Callaghan's, and of course, especially my thanks to Connor for sharing your courageous story. And good morning, everyone. So nice to see all of you here today with us. I want to thank you all for joining us today to commemorate an act of generosity that will help shape the course of Vanderbilt in countless lives for years to come. It is my great honor to announce that in one of the most transformative donations in Vanderbilt's history, Marjorie and Hal Roberts have dedicated a visionary philanthropic gift to establish the Roberts Academy and Dyslexia Center at Vanderbilt University. This center, which is poised to become the preeminent center on dyslexia in the United States, will provide unparalleled educational services to young children with dyslexia and operate as a hub for innovation, outreach, and research in dyslexia diagnosis and treatment. Helen Marjorie, thank you for your partnership, for your 
remarkable generosity and for entrusting Vanderbilt to carry out your vision for this academy and center. The Roberts Academy and Dyslexia Center will have a transformative impact on young people, both locally and around the world. Reading comprehension, as we've just heard, is fundamental to learning, which is fundamental to realizing the potential of individuals, communities, and humankind. Thanks to you, young people with dyslexia will have barriers removed and new possibilities open to them. Think of Connor, as he just said, how differently his life could have gone if not for the help he received from Sissy and the reading clinic here at Vanderbilt. On behalf of all the children with dyslexia who are out there, their families, and our entire university community, thank you. The gift also marks a new era of philanthropy for Vanderbilt. It is the first major contribution in the university's history from donors who chose Vanderbilt not because of a prior affiliation with the Vanderbilt University, but because they believe Vanderbilt is the best place for the work they envision and the impact they hope to have. After considering a number of possible locations, Helen Marjorie Roberts recognized that Vanderbilt's Peabody College of Education and Human Development, with its outstanding international reputation, highly regarded faculty, and emphasis on learning differences, has the greatest capacity to transform dyslexia education, outreach, and scholarship. I commend Dean Bembo and our colleagues at Peabody, whose standard of excellence has indeed made the college a leading educator of educators. The Roberts Academy and Dyslexia Center will be a premier training ground for teachers who will change countless lives. The Academy and Center will build on notable scholarship already happening within Peabody and continue to attract the world's best and brightest scholars who will collaborate across disciplines to make advancements that shape the way we educate students challenged by dyslexia. Just one short year from now, the Roberts Academy will welcome its first students, providing early diagnosis and assessment services as well as best-in-class instruction backed by the latest research findings. At the same time, the Roberts Dyslexia Center will begin the first phase of its operation, expanding upon the work already happening at Vanderbilt and in Middle Tennessee by providing clinical services, training, and research, ultimately becoming a nexus point for educators and researchers from Vanderbilt and beyond. Together, they will advance what we know about dyslexia and test groundbreaking interventions for it. Both the academy and the center will provide professional development training for teachers and other education professionals who work with students with dyslexia. By educating educators, the Roberts Academy and Dyslexia Center will ensure its impact will be felt well beyond Nashville and for generations to come. The lifelong realization of human potential is Vanderbilt's noble mission. As a leading research university, we are committed to solving society's most urgent and complex problems. This generous gift will help us do both. The Roberts Academy and Dyslexia Center embodies our ambition. It will beautifully illustrate how, with the help of visionary donors like Hell and Marjorie Roberts, we are seizing the moment to un unlock our potential, 
expand our impact and earn our place as the great university of this century. It is fitting that the gift making this academy and center possible comes to us as part of our landmark Dare to Grown fundraising campaign. You just saw that. In a few moments, we will plant a tree symbolizing the power and beauty of growth. The growth of our university, the growth of the Roberts Academy and Center, and most importantly of all, the growth of the children whose lives will be so profoundly shaped by the work we officially begin here today. Let us now dare to grow together as one Vanderbilt into this exciting new chapter, courageously continuing to better ourselves for the betterment of the world. Thank you very much. Okay, so I'm going to give a, uh, a little hint as to the staging. You're all going to see the tree planted, and you don't have to leave your seats. So try to figure out how that's going to happen. Between now and then, we have the luxury of hearing from a panel of experts who will help us understand the full scope of the impact that the Roberts Academy and Center will have. The uh, panelists include Laura Cutting. Laura, Laurie is the Patricia Rhodes and Rhodes Hart Professor and Professor of Special Education, Psychology and Human Development, Electrical and Computer Engineering, Technology and Pediatrics at Vanderbilt University. In her spare time, when she's not doing all that professoring, she's also the Associate Provost in the Office of the Vice Provost for Research and Innovation. Our next panelist is Brett Miller, Brett is from the Eunice Kennedy Shriver National Institute of Child Health and Human Development, where he is the Deputy Branch Chief of the Child Development and Behavior Branch and Program Director for the Literacy and Related Learning Disabilities Program. Thirdly, Emily Soleri is the Edmund H. Henderson Professor of Education and the Coordinator of the Reading Education Program in the School of Education and Human Development at the University of Virginia. Emily, Brett, and Laurie, please join me on stage. Finally, to lead the panel, we are very fortunate today to have John Siegenthaler, managing partner of Finn Partners here in Nashville. You may know John from his many years at NBC News, where he anchored the NBC weekend news program and appeared in many other of their programs and other networks, including Meet the Press and the Discovery Channel. John, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you for inviting me to this uh, wonderful event. Thank you, John, Chancellor Deermeyer. Thank you for your leadership. Um, and to Hal and Marjorie Roberts, I'm so proud to be here for this terrific day. Um, and, and thank you for your gift. Um, Connor, you moved us all, and uh, you have a powerful story to tell, and you told it very well. I, I want to ask Brett first, as we start this conversation, can you give us a, a little historical context when we talk about the need for prevention and intervention when it comes to dyslexia, especially with children? Um, sure. First, I want to say thank you as well for the invitation to be here from Vanderbilt and Peabody College. Um, I'd like, I think I'd like to set a little context that when we think back to um, some of the actions that have led to legislation like the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, ADA prior to that, that we had conceptualized, or the community had conceptualized dyslexia and other individuals who had learning disabilities. Um, as both an educational issue in terms of their needs, aspirations, and goals, but also as a social justice and equity issue. And given that dyslexia is a condition that cuts across all racial and ethnic groups, cuts across all economic strata, 
and across the geography of the US and the world. I think it's important for us to be, to ensure that all of those individuals' voices and perspectives are brought to the paper. And how do you think uh, this center and this academy will help do that? I think it provides the resources and the opportunity to bring a host of diverse stakeholders together. So we've got a range of faculty who have been committed to doing work in intervention around brain-related science here at Vanderbilt and other institutions that they work with. There's engagement occurring within the community and this can facilitate further activities to be able to bring those partners together to think about transformative work that's community engaged. Um, Emily. I know that you work with policymakers to help, under, help them understand dyslexia and, and, and the needs to help people with dyslexia. So um, how do you think an entity like the center and this academy um, will advance the conversation for lawmakers to provide support for programs like this? Sure. Um, I think it's really important to recognize that learning how to read and write is arguably one of the most um, studied aspects of human learning. So we know a lot about evidence-based practice, about evidence-based assessment, evidence-based screening of young kids um, who have reading difficulties. And when I think about policy and the work that we do in Virginia around engaging with policymakers, um, there are states across this country who are um, grappling with policy in different ways but the core issue is the same. And, it, this, and the issue is that every single child, no matter where they go to school, deserves to arrive at a school with a teacher who is prepared to teach them how to read and write, and also teachers who have the materials in their hands to do that. We need to equip our teachers with that. So when we think about policy and my engagement with the General Assembly in Virginia is really around how do we have evidence-based policy in this space? These laws that are, going, uh, that are happening all over the country, I don't see that stopping. There is a lot of momentum in that space. And it is our responsibility as scholars and researchers to engage with policymakers to ensure that um, the laws that are passing make sense. And the way that you do this is you have to be really very clear about translating our science. Um, the way that we talk to policymakers and families and community members is different from how we talk to other scientists about what we're doing. And you have to learn how to do that. And I think a center like this could really you know, pick up that momentum. And um, there are a lot of faculty already at Vanderbilt who do amazing science around reading development, around assessment, around intervention. And using the center to translate that into policy that is actually feasible for teachers to implement, for districts to implement, um, and that makes sense for state legislators to fund. And this, you know, talking about the funding issue here is a really very important, you have to sustain the funding for the long term. Well, when you talk to those lawmakers, tell me about their awareness of Dyslexia. Sure, it depends on the lawmaker. So some of our lawmakers have this is this is um, they have a family maker, a family member who might have dyslexia or a, or some sort of reading disability, and so it's personal. Um, for other folks, it's not. Um, but setting up the argument that reading and writing is fundamental to lifelong success. We are not just talking about teaching kids how to read and write. We're talking about um, what happens to children in their every other content area, about their lifelong earning potential, about their social emotional development, this is all intertwined. Um, and so making that argument about it, this is about the whole child and we have to make investments early and we also know that that early literacy development is critical. So making sure that every state has early warning systems around screen for kids at risk and sort of talking about the importance of catching this early and intervening early. Um, and I will also say, we're n we don't want to make this political. Literacy should not be political. This is a bipartisan issue that most folks around the table can get around, get, yeah. get on board with. Laurie, I understand that the Roberts Academy and Center is going to focus on a lot of outreach activities. Can you describe those outreach activities? 
Yeah, well, the thing is, is that I think what the Roberts Academy really has the ability to do in that types of outreach activities that they're going to be involved in, such as teacher training um, and tutoring and assessment, is the ability to sort of take what Brett and Emily were talking about and um, make it sort of come in action from the ground up. Um, and so, you know, being able to reach out to kids who um, may not have the opportunity uh, normally to receive tutoring and things like that. I mean, um, I, I, just not to interrupt, but when no. I think about outreach, I think about Connor and his right. family and um, the need to help families like yours uh, to, to, to get the help you need. Um, bringing that to scale, right? So the issue is, as Emily was talking about and Brett was talking about, we know a lot of things. We have a lot of evidence-based practices, but figuring out how to scale that up and to reach all kids like Connor is really sort of the, the big challenge. And having the, the types of resources that the Roberts Academy will bring will really infuse a lot of ability to do those kinds of efforts. I, I guess there are a lot of families out there that don't know, and so you're, yeah. you're, that don't know what you offer, don't know what's available, how do you, how do you help them understand that there is something that they can do and, and they, there is help out there? Well, I think, you know, it starts with, with excellent communication and actually having resources available and knowing, and people knowing that there are resources available and that Vanderbilt has this ability to extend out and help families. Brett, let's talk a little bit about technology. And, and there has been a huge advancement in technology when it comes to reading. Um, can you talk about, and I don't know what assistive options are, but maybe you'd explain assistive options and how they impact both, both older children and adults with dyslexia. Sure, so these are tools that um, educators, individuals can use to assist them to access text, to access the content of the text in, in the case of reading. Um, so historically, it, it's moved really rapidly. So we've moved from having individuals go into a soundproof booth, do recordings where they're reading books and providing those recordings to, to individuals such that they'd have access to whether we're talking about textbooks or holy text, whatever it may be, whether school, professional. Um, now we've got technology that's migrated from sort of this almost mechanical sounding uh, voice coming out of your computer, reading the text that's on the screen to these generative AI models that where you can choose your speaker, where you can choose sort of the um, what sound is more appealing for you. You can adjust the speeds um, of what you're hearing. Uh, I think the challenge though that we face is that we have less we don't have an ideal understanding of when to use them, um, when they're most effective for learners, and in sort of what combination, because we've got a range of tools. This is just the one I gave was just one example. So, you know, it's a lot of opportunity to get, you know, as, as the video was talking about, access to like science content, access to other domains, and as an adult, you can use these in the workplace. Well, so, I was gonna ask the difference between dealing with children and then older children and adults. Yeah. Uh, what are those challenges? So for older adults, or, or for adults and older adults, you can imagine using it at the workplace um, to access content that you need to read. There's versions of it like <laughs> with some of the generative AI to where you can generate text now um, to facilitate in writing. Um, and where I think it's also helpful but somewhat underutilized is that you can use, you know, these tools are portable. You can use them in the home. And so if you want to sit and read with your child or if, it's in a, if there's an intergenerational challenge around reading and sit with your grandmother and interact around text together, it opens up opportunities for dialogues that are not just important for educational or professional reasons but also for cultural reasons within the community. Emily, we've talked about communication, the importance of communication. Uh, how do you connect communities and organizations um, to, to talk about this issue, to address these issues around dyslexia? Yeah, so my approach to this may be a little bit different, but when I, I arrived at University of Virginia five years ago, and I just, I just made it my job to say yes. And what I mean by that is to say yes to anyone who wanted to talk about literacy. It did not matter the group, there were moms groups, there were you know, community groups, and getting to know people 
around what are the core issues for this state and across the country really very important. And one of the things that I think has been so successful about our work in Virginia, particularly around our legislation, is that we brought everybody to the table early. We planned for our legislation two years in advance, and we brought every possible person that could touch literacy to the Boys and Girls Club, after school programs, libraries, faculty, um, higher ed, teacher education and ed prep programs, policy makers, and we started, early, we started early and often, I like to say. We had many meetings. And part of that was the parents and bringing folks to the table. And I think you have to approach that space with some humility um, because I understand the research, I understand the science, I understand how to translate that into practice. Um, but I don't understand the experience of families who are going through this. And I don't under, fully understand the experience of every single teacher going through this and what, what they're trying to do. What do you say to, to those do. groups? Yeah. When you go to those groups, what do you say? Um, I think it's important to listen. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying much, I'm listening. Because if we're mm -hmm. going to have evidence-based policy that um, can serve everyone and includes everyone's sort of perspective on what's going on, it's important to listen and also sometimes guide. Because um, there, are, there are some myths out there about dyslexia and what it means and what it means for kids' experiences and teachers. And to make sure that if we are moving forward together, we're moving forward in a way that is based in evidence. When you listen, what do they tell you? A lot of frustration from parents and families. Um, actually, a lot of anger from teachers that they were not well prepared to teach reading. Um, through their education preparation programs that they feel like they have failed um, generations of students, especially our teachers that have been around for a while. They don't understand. I mean, this evidence based on literacy and writing and reading development has been around for decades. And in so many ways, we have failed to translate that into practice, and that it, part of that is through um, our education preparation programs. So frustration and anger. And then also, uh, I think the other part, side of that is when you bring everyone to the table, it creates a sense of hope. Like, okay, people are here, they are listening, we are trying to move forward together, um, and that's really important in this space. Lori, how does Vanderbilt's expertise in many areas enable them to, to leverage this gift? Yeah, so Peabody College of Education has expertise that spans sort of, I mean, it's such an unusual place because it has expertise in intervention, has expertise in sort of basic fundamental research in, into brain bases of dyslexia, um, you know, you name it, there's, there's expertise that crosses the swath that's needed to really scale up and use a, an incredible um, opportunity like this to, to help children with dyslexia. I mean, the work that you've already done and now this gift, can you talk about that and, and how that works together to, to really make this whole thing work? In, in what sense? Well, just, I mean, um, when you think about what Vanderbilt has, has focused on and the many areas it's focused on, um, are there specific areas that you think uh, this, this work will, uh, how, how this work, how this gift will really impact it? Yes, so, you know, there's always sort of, I think as Emily was talking about and Brevard's talking about, there's always kind of this divide between what's going on in the research world and what's known in the research world, which is, and what is happening in practice. And having like one entity that integrates school outreach services, clinical services, assessment with ongoing research here is really an incredibly unique opportunity to have something that seamlessly sort of talks to each other so the research components can be integrated in the school, the school components can be integrated in the outreach activities. And so all of these different pieces, they don't often exist in one place. And I think having all this expertise and all these other pieces that, that typically operate more on their own, right? Because there are schools for kids with learning disabilities and there are clinics, you know, kids with learning disabilities, but having them all in one place with the researchers and the opportunity for those ideas to flow back and forth. Because as Emily was talking about, the listening is really, really important. Mm -hmm. I learn the most from listening. And I can tell you that all of my personal research ideas that I've had have always come 
from listening to teachers and to needs from, from out there in the community. I've never actually written a grant that I haven't actually had a teacher um, colleague of mine read and say, is this important? Like, should we do this? Should I do this? Or is this just a silly idea? Every, every single grant I've ever submitted. So talking about research, and I want uh, all of you to weigh in on this, but, but Emily, let you start. Uh, from a research perspective, what do we still need to learn about better helping people with dyslexia? Yeah, so I am, we know a lot. We know a lot. We have had decades of research, and I think this pace, you know, where I think it's really important to put our energy, in, our energy is into translating what we know into practice. Um, and so there is a science to this. There's implementation science, there's translational science, and those are things that we really need to be thinking about because every child deserves access to this evidence base. Every deserved child deserves access to a teacher who can teach them how to read and write. Um, and we have to think, of, think really critically about what are the barriers and the facilitators to implementation of evidence-based practices. Um, and that one lever you pull on is policy you know, and smart policy, but there's other things that we can do in this space to ensure um, the translation of our science into practice. Um, and I think that takes faculty members and researchers who are willing to engage in that way. Um, it's not for everybody. It's actually, the translational piece of this is, it's really time consuming. Um, and we, we absolutely still need folks who are really advancing the science, right? Science evolves over time. Um, you know, I see my role as I am partly advancing the science in my work, but at the same time the outreach to ensure that the translation is happening. We need to implement the things we know right now. We don't need to wait 10, 20 years to implement what we know right now. Brad, what do you think? Uh, I, I think for me I'll, I'll make two points. I think centering our efforts with equity at its center. Um, and keeping that in mind and all the activities we do and how we engage, I think it's gonna be critical moving forward. Um, I think this center in particular, given the faculty um, here at Vanderbilt, is like focusing on intensive intervention. So focusing on learners that have been the least responsive to our state of the science intervention that Emily's been talking about and what we can do to identify those individuals earlier so that we have a longer opportunity to intervene and uh, think about what the next generation of intensive interventions would look like. Lauren? Yeah, so just, you know, I think Brett and Emily really summarized it well in terms of, of areas of research that we need to be thinking about. I mean, scaling up and figuring out how do you do that, implementation science. Um, and that really plays a lot into what Brett was saying about equity of access um, to things that we already know and should be implementing. Um, and then, of course, there, there is the age-old question of sort of what works for whom and why some kids respond and others don't, and understanding more about the, the, the cognitive and neurobiological mechanisms of that, which hopefully downstream will then lead to better prevention efforts. We talked a lot about impact, and especially the impact of the gift that Hal and Marjorie have so generously given. Talk about the impact of this. What, what do you see, Emily, as the impact of a gift like this? Yeah, I, you know, I think when you have the opportunity to have faculty involved directly with outreach and faculty who are doing science in this space, um, working in a center with the, you know, sort of eye on the prize, that it, this is about children, it's actually about nobody else, this is about kids, and we sort of, if that's your North Star, um, the, being able to take what they, folks are learning in real time and translate that into practice is huge, because there is a lot of space between what we learn in labs at universities and what's happening in schools every single day for children. Um, and when we, when we work with teachers in this space, they need to know the why. Why do I need to change my practice potentially? But also, more importantly, how. What do I do tomorrow that's different and based in the evidence? Te teachers will look at me and say, you can talk to me about reading science all day, but what do I do tomorrow in my classroom, lady? What am I supposed to do? 
Mm -hmm. So that's really important, the why and the how here. And I think that this center has the potential to be, to be doing the science to really understand the why better and also translate that into the how at scale. Well, thank you for all the work you do on dyslexia. And thank you for being here today and sharing some of your insights. We appreciate it. Let's yeah. give them a round of applause. I just want to say while they uh, rearranged the chairs here that um, we were touched by Connor's story and I think the reason is there's so many of us who are touched by dyslexia. Whether or not we have a family member or a friend, we all know someone who has dyslexia and we want them to get the help they need. So uh, we have a little video and let's talk a little bit about the impact of legacy. Take a look. <gasps> that is so fun, Norris. Like she's gonna make an indoor tire swing for her school. And I'm gonna make black. Do you know what I'm drawing? I'm drawing the window right now. All parents want to help their children reach their biggest potential. And I couldn't do it because I didn't know what to do. Had I not found out about the dyslexia, had I not gotten the right help, my kids would not have loved to learn. People often throughout their lives think of what can I leave? What can I do that's a benefit to mankind? And our grandchildren gave that to us when they developed dyslexia. Julia's children made this for Hal's 80th birthday. These are her five. Here's Leah. So when Leah was in first grade at a Montessori school and he would go and hide during reading time, his teacher did not have a clue what was going on and nobody could help me. And it was, it was so hard. And the more I've spoken with parents, people describe, that was my, that was my child. I said, I didn't find you the right way to learn. I had to find you where they can teach you. And that's what the Roberts Academy can do. They get the right teachers for the right children. To see a child with dyslexia who has suffered is really tragic. The next question is, well, what do we do about it? And so we just felt compelled to create a school for, for these kids with dyslexia. It's a transformational gift the Roberts gift. And it's going to enable us to fulfill our mission, which is to enhance humankind. We will be able to fulfill our mission at Peabody in terms of research, teaching, and outreach, and helping children thrive. The first thing they learn when they go to the academy is that you have dyslexia. It's okay, and it's a superpower. The reason they can't read is because they have not been taught the way they learn. Parents are gonna be incredibly grateful and extremely happy to find a school that's designed for their children's learning needs. That degree of specialization that the academy is gonna be able to provide for children with dyslexia is incredibly important, not just to research, but to those families who are looking for a school just like this. They ask children in a school that's on campus, what do they think uh, an academy should look like? And that's this, a playground, I presume, over there. The purple and blue probably, and green. Probably, yeah, <laughs> with all the rocks around it. But this is the school, because here's the chimney. Dyslexia is not going to go away. They are not going to find a vaccine for it. It's an advantage. There will be I'm sure millions of families that will be impacted by what Vanderbilt will be doing. People look at Vanderbilt already. They look at Peabody College and say, what are they doing? And we want other people to say, we're inspired. They have a true giver's heart. They want to change a lot of kids' lives.
Alan Marjorie, you both truly have a giver's heart. And we at Vanderbilt are so grateful that you have chosen to share it with us. And now, I'd like to invite Hal to join me up here to offer a few words today. Good morning. Thank you so much for being here. I think uh, the number of people and the enthusiasm that they are sharing demonstrate uh, your support in, for what Vanderbilt is doing and what they're going to be doing. And thank you to Connor and your family. Connor's a wonderful example of uh, the result of intervention and being taught the way he can learn. What a, what a fantastic example. Most children are excited to begin school and learn to read, but those with dyslexia soon experience failure. They're humiliated when they're called on to read to the class. Their peers call them stupid. Primary school can be a hostile place for a child with dyslexia. They often search for excuses not to go to school. As their class progresses in reading, they cannot. They begin to feel that they are of less intelligence. They are not. Dyslexia is not the result of lower intelligence. A patient tutor, usually the mother, can help them to begin to learn to read unless they find activities that uh, they perform well and enjoy. Their self-confidence can continue to deteriorate, but they are if they're given this opportunity to explore different activities, they can find their sweet spot. And whether it's in sports, music, art, nature, or performance, or otherwise, such an epiphany can provide the opportunity to provide, to prove to themselves and to the world that they can achieve they can salvage their confidence and their self-respect. This experience can set them on a path to success because they will continue to strive to prove themselves to the world. Sir Winston Churchill had dyslexia. By the power of his intellect and the eloquence of his speech, he was elected Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. He led the UK through World War II. He wrote 42 books. 63 biographies have been written of him at last count. The Prime Minister said, the one thing that stood in the way of my education was school. I was considerably discouraged by my school days. It was not pleasant to feel oneself so completely outclassed and left behind at the very beginning of the race. Sir Winston did not have the benefit of a specialized school that provided a supportive environment, smaller classes, or remediation in reading, spelling, and writing, or offered exposure to a wide range of diverse activities. The academy will provide all of these. 
We believe that Peabody College is the best school to host the next academy for kids with dyslexia and to train teachers to educate and inspire those children. The Dyslexia Center is a major step forward that will benefit thousands of children and their families and inspire other universities. It will be a great beacon that shines brightly around the world. Thank you to Vanderbilt University and the Pea Valley College for accepting with great enthusiasm the opportunity, the challenge, and our dream. May God bless the Academy and the Delexia Center. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Hal, and welcome Marjorie on stage. We're now delighted to plant our tree as a symbol of growth. We're going to get some. Okay.